but just sitting here and talking with you guys about Mark reminds me of, of uh, actually when I first met Mark, I uh, didn't I didn't meet him physically. I was working in Houston uh, in an art department, and a fellow that was producing a show for Mark needed some artwork done to promote the show, and he came to me to do that. And I saw the artwork that he was promoting, and I said, "Well, this is I like this guy's work." And he said, "Yeah, you know, he's just." And he told me his age, and he was younger than me. And I'm thinking, wow, that was some nice stuff. He had a picture of a stagecoach, a runaway stagecoach. It was really impressive. And years later, I actually met Mark. Then I met him personally. And I said something about knowing his work. And he goes, how did you know it? I told him the story. That just started that. And so from that point on, we, we'd run into each other from time to time at different places. And then it was interesting that when we moved up here from Houston, he lived up here, and it turned out we only lived about a block and a half from each other. And uh, Well, Jim, a while ago, was trying to recall when he met uh, Mark, and he said he just didn't remember. He said, I've just known him for so long that I don't know the exact time that I met him. Mm -hmm. uh, but y'all went to school together? Well, we both went to the University of Houston, and he was a loyal, loyal cougar. Uh, and I think that's part of why we meshed, uh, because, but I went to law school at the University of Houston, and he had gone to undergraduate school, and of course we both loved sports, and uh, uh, I always told him, because he went to high school in Odessa, I have a really good friend that played football at Odessa, and uh, I told Mark, I said, you played on the most talented backfield in the history of high school football because Mark was the fullback and Larry Gatlin was the quarterback. And where would you have more talent than and those two, two people? Yeah. yeah. One could sing and one could paint. Paint, absolutely. <laughs> and then be an athlete, and that's you very got, unusual. You've got a picture here that, that uh, I think, did you commission Mark to do that? I did. This was his last, unfortunately, this is his last painting. But the what I, what I wanted him to do, I have this, picture that, that was taken when I was playing at Arlington State. And so what I wanted him to do, I, want, I asked him, could you do a painting for me? And I wanted him to paint this photograph. And so uh, I said, what do I have to do? And he gave me a price on the commission and gave me the check. And immediately when I gave him the check, he said, okay, I want to see all your annuals. I want to see any newspaper pictures. He did research. Have. Oh, man. He he did he oh, wanted yeah. all yeah. that, and so this is the end result. Let's let's see. This yeah. is okay. So what what was it that he changed on there that I noticed he put the team name down here? Okay, what this so. is this is a composite of Hold my it. career. Let's see. Turn let's, it around. Okay, I'm gonna look at it like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But what he did. I played in high school, I played for the Brenham Cubs. That's the green uniforms. You see the Cubs coming across. So that's you and all those. Yeah. All of these are made. All, all of these are made. And you can see he did the free throw yeah. circle and all. I mean, just it was just astounding to me that he he could come up with this and be that creative in everything. But then I played at Arlington State, and we were the Arlington State Rebels. That's the white uniform. Mm -hmm. Two items on the painting were not completed because he, in fact, he called me when he knew that he had cancer. Uh, and so he didn't finish two items. This, that looks like a ghost, that was going to, that's a pirate. Okay. Because I, he hadn't filled it in yet. Exactly. I played for the Southwestern Pirates, so that was going to be the Pirates. And then he asked me, he said, is there any one game that you remember? Well, when I'm at Arlington, Arlington was a division of Texas A&M. Tarleton was also a division of Texas A&M. They were bitter, bitter, bitter rivals. <laughs> Our coach, Coach Tinker, had gone to Tarleton. We had beaten Tarleton the year before. He cried after the game, cried after the game because it meant so much to him. But we beat Tarleton, 
and I can't tell you what, I think we beat them something like 130 something to 118 well, this, in Stephenville. This painting, when, when the, the museum was able to go in and, and recover the things that he left for his legacy to be on display here. Yeah. Um, because this was yours. It was returned. That is to correct. You. That is correct. But that was the last thing on his easel where his chair and his brushes and everything sat for him to work on. And we have the mall stick here that he used that he would hold to steady his hand to do the detail that he yeah. did down here. But this was returned to you back then and um, this is it was and really this, interesting. And, and this is actually a, a, a print and it's smaller than the actual uh, painting. Uh, but one of the things to show you how detailed he was, he and I couldn't remember. These are Converse All Stars. Right. That was the scoop. That was the shoe of the day. There, there right. weren't any Air Jordans or anything like that. Everybody wore Converse All Stars. <laughs> Neither he nor I could remember where the star was. Yeah. And so I went home. I said, and I got. I still had a pair and brought them up because he wanted to he wanted the painting to be accurate mm -hmm. and uh and to me it's it, it's absolutely amazing because once i saw it the title of this painting is the jump shot do you have the original painting yes that, okay right. yes yeah well, that yes. was all returned right yeah well while we're sitting here mm -hmm. all of these things in the uh, his gallery here at the museum he used for resources for his paintings. He wanted accuracy, like you said. He, oh, re he just, researched. When, when we got his uh, building that was full of his work and then his research, he had a room full of research material. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he was... I want to jump in on, on, okay. on the, the detail, the research, um, by pointing to the level of research he did to create the barkeep rules, which is, this is one of a series of paintings paying tribute to the significant role of the barkeep, or I call them the saloon keep, yeah. um, in the Old West. And his research taught him that the barkeep in any given town was just as important as the mayor or the city council. <laughs> or the minister. Maybe, maybe more so. <laughs> and, and in his research, those who were lucky enough to get inside Mark's studio found a saloon. Mark built a bar. He made it look like a part, a, a real saloon. Mark, you were talking about acquiring, and you all have a lot of the artifacts that he used to inspire his work. The top hat yeah. mm -hmm. is somewhere here in the museum. Right there. It's that one over here. There we yeah, go. So There's right the there. top hat. Yeah, he had a glass enclosed case on one wall of the studio that had that painting, and beside it, on pedestals and various things, he had some of the. Um, the the artifacts that he had collected, the shoes. He has the shoes. You you probably have them somewhere here in the the museum as as well. It, he went to incredible lengths to make sure that his work was authentic, that there was n no question about this being um, a real image in his. Western paint in his painting. He did. He did basically the Norman Rockwell realism of of that mm -hmm. because this is very similar to the way Rockwell worked, where he would put the people in the clothing that he wanted and then photograph them so that he got the accuracy of the proportion of the clothing and how it fit and the folds and everything in it. And maybe um, you have a did list. Beautiful work with that. You have a list of quotes from him. Uh, tell us, read some of them off, off of your list. Well, to kind of tell. How I was always interested in his being a football player because, in my world, I had never met a, somebody who had played football rather passionately, <laughs> and then became an incredibly passionate artist as well. So I did find a quote in going through some old newspaper articles from Mark that said, "When you play football." you have to do a lot of things you don't want to do. 
as an artist, you need to have the same discipline. Um, there was also another quote that said, there was never any question what I was going to do with my life. I'm not sure how that sat with the board that gave Mark the full football scholarship to the <laughs> University of Houston. Hey, as long as he could play. Yeah. That's what they were interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these are, um, these are, there's other quotes that you have that I think would be kind of neat to bring out as we go along, especially with some of this, the, these things. The, um, the attitude that he had of, of his research uh, is something that many people, many people have to go and go outside and look at a tree to paint the tree. Mark would build a tree inside his studio <laughs> <laughs> to get it just the way he wanted it. And if he had to, I mean, he would go to that extent. He had a full wood shop. He would build his own frames. He would build his stands for his bronzes. He would build the bases for the bronzes. It usually would be sent out to some cabinet shop somewhere. Mark was capable of doing all those things. You know, he, he, just, he, he just had that talent. And he didn't look at anything as something he couldn't learn to do when it came to being creative. And that's, that was the thing that, that made him the artist that he was, was that, that, that passion and creativity and how he looked at things and interpreted those things and, and then shared them with the rest of us in his paintings mm -hmm. because we all enjoy them looking at it from that standpoint. Well, I'm not as fortunate as y'all. I did not have a personal uh, relationship with him. Mine came at the end of his life. And uh, when we went, when Joe and I went over to his gallery and walked through it, it was like being in a, fancy, uh, a fantasy land to me. I just couldn't believe that somebody could do all these things and produce all these things. Uh, like I said, I didn't know him, and I, did, I, w I wished I would have known him better, but I didn't have the opportunity. I knew him through community. Well, he was a fun guy. He, yeah. he oh, had a yeah. real good personality, yeah. joke. And he had an eye for the ladies. Yeah. He had an eye for the ladies. Uh, he had good, and he had good vision. <laughs> <laughs> I used to marvel when I'd go to his studio, and I'd go because it's very close. And uh, I just periodically go in and visit him with the Indian paintings because the yeah. Indian paintings to me looked like you were there at a window and you were inside the house and the Indian was standing outside. They were so realistic. It just and didn't he have Indian blood? He did. He did. He did. Yes, but but uh, those what was his mom? What was his? His mother was half Chickasaw. Chickasaw. Yeah. And so that would make Mark one quarter Chickasaw. Yeah. Quarter, yeah. And as I understand, I never met her, but I understand I she was her. an accomplished artist. She as was. Well. She was. She was. She was internationally known. Wow. But she did. Uh, she published uh, four books. Uh -huh. on she porcelain did. painting. Yeah. Yeah, porcelain. Beautiful work. A beautiful work. The fact that you could go over there and go in and out like that, you were a favored friend. Because Mark didn't open his studio to just people just come roaming in. Oh, hey, is this an art studio? Can I come in? Yeah. Uh, I remember in my art studio, I had somebody walk in one time and they had seen that it was, it was the name that I had at that time was called Mustard Seed Studio. And a guy came in and he talked to me for about five or 10 minutes. And then I said, well, what can I help you with? And he pulls out a roll of film. <laughs> I wants to know if I can process his film for him. I said, I'm not a photo studio. <laughs> but Mark was, Mark was totally, uh, you, you pretty much didn't get in there unless you were by invitation. And uh, it was There's privileged. One, you know. one, I think a very positive exception, but it does suggest having an invitation too. I mean, I, I thought of his studio as sacred ground. You know, it was like an Indian mound <laughs> it really was, from my perspective, and I um, remember asking him, actually begging him, uh, to allow uh, a number of artists who were going to be convening in Conroe as part of the Lone Star Art Guild annual convention. And we thought a trip to a working artist studio would be an interesting experience. Well, these artists who opted to go had no idea what they were in for. And originally Mark had said, uh, I will do it under the following conditions. 
there will be two tours. There will not be any more than 10 people in each tour. They can stay 30 minutes and they cannot bring cameras. And I had to be with each of the groups. <coughs> well, once the, the people, arrived, the first group arrived, Mark started making connections. Um, there happened to be one artist that he had known for 20 some years but hadn't seen her for the last five years. Um, there were art teachers in the group. And the 30 minutes went to 40 minutes, went to 50 minutes, <laughs> went to an hour and about an hour and a half. I don't know what the second group was doing, waiting for their turn. But he loved it. And all of the people who were lucky enough to sign up loved it too, the first group and the second group. Um, he didn't allow anybody to take pictures, but uh, there was one teacher, Betty Arnold, from the public school system, an art teacher for many years, who just said, I just wish my students could look at this studio. The studio was inspiring. Like I say, it was a fantasy world for me. Well, I'm, not, I'm not an artist, and I couldn't believe it. He had wax figures that he was working on uh, before they were bronzed, and he had a, a paintings that he had, and I thought, oh, gosh. And I can't, I'm the most unartistic person in the <laughs> world. But we're so fortunate to have this it's a, in Conroe for Montgomery County residents oh, and yeah. visitors to come and well, see. Well, he had, a lot of art studios will have more than one project going at a time, and he would have maybe one or two pieces of sculpture, plus a painting or a picture he was commissioned to do or one he just wanted to do. And very often, uh, being an artist myself, I know if somebody sees a piece before it's finished, they, they often get a conclusion of what it is before they see the finished thing. And the artist very often, many artists would cover their work when, it, when people would come in, just so you couldn't see what they were working on. Did you ever see would, him putting clay on a sculpture or putting a stroke well, on Well, no, and by the same token, if, if, uh, if he came by my place, uh, I would stop whatever I was painting, and not that I was hiding anything, it's just mm -hmm. that, that you can't concentrate on what you're doing, and, and like him, I would hit a level of concentration that I didn't know what was going on around me once I, if I got into mm -hmm. what I was doing. And Mark was the same way. I would see, we, we talk about that. That was one of the common things that he and I, even though we worked totally different, uh, we had uh, respect for each other and, and that, that when we got into that passion, into that moment, uh, things would just change. I wouldn't know what was going on and time would just go by because I was so concentrated on, on accomplishing. I wouldn't think to eat or anything. I'd just keep working until I hit a certain point. And then when I hit that point, well, then I would relax. And he would do the same thing. He'd go, for, he'd go way into the night, as I did. We talk about how often we got our best work done at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, up, just because that's when we felt like doing it. And um, we had a, when you're in that, you have a whole different work perspective and than most other people. Most, most artists, if they're into it like Mark and myself full time, um, our schedule is not like everybody else's. You know, our, during the daytime when everybody else is carrying briefcases and heading for work, we're sitting somewhere drinking a cup of coffee, watching them, thinking, well, I'm glad I don't have to do that. Yeah. But we're up at two or three o'clock in the morning trying to meet a deadline maybe on something. So I think that's why you're all <coughs> Artists are unique people, and, and that sets them apart of why you can do the things that you can do uh, that I would never envision. Now, I could look at them and enjoy them, but I surely couldn't create. That's what he wanted you to see. When he was, when he was through, it and then he was ready to reveal it. He had different reasons for doing his art. It wasn't just commercially, to, just to market. It was to capture history and a feeling and a, a, I don't know, kind of a theme of what the Southwest is all about, Texas and the whole Southwest. But I think he loved every subject that he put either into a painting or, or in a sculpture. I mean, clearly there was the connection to, to being a Native American, 
Um, he felt strongly about that. And he told me he also felt the negative effects of being a, an American Indian, um, you know, not fully accepted. There were times in his life that he experienced the, a, a bit of the discrimination. And there, he felt deeply about the Lakota tribe and, you know, the, the heartbreak that a lot of Indians went through when they were taken away from their homes. And I wish we had the painting. I believe one of his relatives uh, owns a painting that was his tribute to the... Trail of Tears. Uh, no, by, by well, it, it, I, I don't know exactly what, what particular event it related to, but part of it had to do with the importance of the buffalo yeah. um, to Native Americans and that that was also taken away from them. And he tried to create by juxtaposing the buffalo and symbols of the Lakota tribe in one painting. I, I really wish we had even a picture of it here. I think his brother-in-law had it. Um, and I saw a photo of it, uh, but I also saw the print, what he had written about it. And to my knowledge, I don't know if it's true with yours, but I'm lucky enough to have bought one of Mark's paintings. And it, it came with a full page explanation mm -hmm. about, why the, about the painting. Um, it's actually here. Um, it's, it's called Crow Chief Plenty Coup, and it was, it, it is a magical painting. You have to be able to see it as the light during the day changes inside the house. At night, when the lights are lower, it, it truly does glow. It has a life of its own. And the painting referred to um, November 11th, 1932, when Chief Plenty Coup was invited to represent all Native Americans at the dedication of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, you know, that's the thing that, that uh, when Mark approached uh, me and then uh, Gertie about uh, knowing with his illness, with his cancer, that uh, he wanted to leave his work for the people of Conroe. He wanted to leave it in this community. He didn't want to just leave it just in a gallery or to another museum. He specifically wanted it here in, in what was his new hometown, which was Conroe. And he asked if the museum, Heritage Museum, would be willing to take on that responsibility and take his work display it or just have it so it would be here for all time for people to come and look at it and uh, enjoy it which is what we took that mission to do and our mission is to preserve protect and display and uh, perpetuate and we do that and if you you know and you tell your friends to come over here you know and, and see anything they want to see of any of the paintings that are in this gallery we have a double gallery here actually just dedicated and will stay this way too mark usually this room in the past has had changeable uh things i think you even donated some stuff one time that we did the, the, the aviation the yes. space thing you yes. had the space and you had the gentleman and from it stayed uh, about a month Montgomery and that took it all down well had, mark will stay up yeah. it'll it'll stay here permanently and permanently. it should very well yeah. should. Well, I can remember the morning that I got a call from uh, a, a lawyer, and he said he was representing Mark, and that Mark would like to have a conference with me. And at that time, he was already in an assisted living facility. And I made many trips over there, and he told me a lot of things that he wanted. He said, I wanted a, le a legacy, and if I don't give it to somebody or something, some place that will be permanent, um, it'll all go away. So we were just thrilled, the museum board was just thrilled to get uh, 
the opportunity to have this. And then when we saw all, we had no idea what, well, how much <laughs> that he had. And um, uh, we had to go through and inventory everything. And, and uh, I don't think we ever got our price along anything. No, our, I, don't our, think, I know we never did. But it, it's, it's uh, just, we can't say how much we appreciated our, uh, the value of it. And um, I hope that a lot of the people that uh, have known about Mark will come to the museum and see this wonderful Yeah, people, that, we, have, we have rifles. They're not in this gallery, they're in another gallery in a particular case. This is primarily for that, and it's a collection, and, and there's some rifles in there, some muzzle loaders, but there's also an 1873 Remington, or Winchester, octagon, uh, barrel, very heavy repeating rifle, one of the <laughs> first lever action repeating rifles, and uh, when you pick that rifle up, you realize that when you see them in the movies, lifting them over the head, running around like it's just a toy. Well, it probably is a real toy <laughs> because this thing, this thing, you got to have some muscle to, to play with this thing. You know, very heavy. But he had all that stuff. He he really had quite a good collection. What, did he finish his bronze of Doctor Red Duke? No. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Because I, I there were times when I'd go over there and I remember he was so precise. He fixed Dr. Duke's hat so it would flip up mm -hmm. because he had to do that to do something to Dr. Duke's He was doing eyes. the glasses. Yeah. The glasses. Yes. And the yeah. only way he could get the tool in there to do that was to, the brim of the hat had to come off Yeah. so that he could get in there and work on that and put it back on. Yeah, he had a lot of little tricks that he did in there. Yeah, yeah. But, but that was just fascinating. <clears throat> just fascinating that he went to such detail uh, and uh, for the, uh, to me his 16 symbols of Texas is just you know uh, that's a popular print we have yes. those prints here yeah and and uh, I've known and I think when he came over for my high school reunion uh, I think we may have uh, I know he bought some of those because the host of the reunion got uh, one of those yeah, Jim took him to a high school reunion. High school reunion. Oh, Brenham, Brenham High. Brenham, Brenham. Brenham High. Brenham High. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what uh, caused, but he was, you know, I, obviously he went and he spoke to the group. He was, and I mean, he was part of the group. He was part of the group. He would have, he'd have been a good Brenham Cub. He mixed right in. His, his last year, uh, we invited him, my wife, uh, Asked him one holiday, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? And he goes, well, not much. She goes, well, yeah, you're coming to our house for Thanksgiving. And he came over. And he wasn't shy, but he wasn't jumping to be outgoing. Mm -hmm. He was, but, he but was minute, private. But the yeah, minute, he was a real yeah, private he was, person. He was private for about 15 seconds <laughs> when he got to our house. And when he sat down, my sister and other members of my family came, my brother and his wife and my sister and her husband and stuff. And the minute they walked in and introduced them to him, they sat and he started to talk and, and he just, he became the center of the conversation for a while with, the, with telling stories. And of course, you know, in our families, you meet somebody new, you, we always ask them questions, you know, well, where are you from? What'd you do? How'd you, you know, get started and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, he had a great time. He came back for another holiday and spent with us you know, just because he enjoyed it, he said. But he was a fun person. Yeah. Fun yeah. person. A lot. Yeah. You really enjoy, or I really enjoyed being around him. And, uh, you know, he fit with most anybody. I didn't have the opportunity to know him yeah. yet. He was not well, and he got yeah. weaker and weaker. And, but he definitely, you knew what he wanted and how he wanted it. Mm -hmm. and, well, I wasn't shy about that. He he did tell me about feeling uncomfortable in big groups, and he did not. I don't know of anything. I never saw anything he did to promote his own work. You may have some no. exceptions to that. But he but, overcame that shyness. Well, <laughs> no. And and somewhere there's a quote that he wanted the. Um, 
the art to sell itself. And he told me a story, and there's no one else I know who knew him who had ever heard of the story, but I'm gonna need help with the name. But there's a socialite in Houston who was associated with Charles Wilson. She had a right. TV, Joanne. Oh, oh yeah, I know who you're talking about. What was her name? Deering? Oh. No, Joanne. No. Oh, I'm. Joanne Herring. Herring. There it yeah. is, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> she must have seen, somehow she knew about Marx work and there was a big <coughs> exhibit that he did with two other artists in Houston at a museum that no longer exists. It was called the Museum of the Old West and it was called and the exhibit was called Three Mark Three Marks on Texas, I think, mm -hmm. something like that. Anyway, I, I'm assuming she either he, he got a lot of publicity in those days. I think after he did the the bronze cougar statue for the University, University of Houston. Um, you, the, the museum has a lot of the newspaper clippings about him, so maybe that's how she heard about him. But at any rate, he told me by way of ex explaining how shy he was that she had thrown a party at her magnificent estate and she wanted his paintings to decorate her house <laughs> for the party. And of course, she wanted him there. And he said, if it hadn't been for one person whose name he never gave me, he would have died there. He was, he felt so uncomfortable. Oh, um, well, I don't know if there was a theme for the party, mm -hmm. if she was doing it as a fundraiser, I have no idea. He didn't give me those details. It's really flamboyant. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. But, um, you know, that was just, I, there's no record of it. I know I've gone through a lot of the research here. The museum has been kind enough to allow me to <laughs> to research some of it, and there's nothing I can find that attests to it, but it, but it's a story he told me. Um, yes, to, to, to explain that he was uncomfortable. Well, also when he got there, he, we talked about that, not that particular total event, but he was saying something one time. Of, you get there and people start, looking at your art and somebody says, oh, and here's the artist, let me introduce you, this is the artist, and then people start, and you, you feel like drawing back is kind of like, you know, yes, I am, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, he said he just felt like it is, and they'd ask questions about, well, why did you do that particular one, and well, I just felt like doing it, you know, and, and there's uncomfortable questions that, that, that often are asked, and when they, when, when she took him around, and she was really, pushing him out, you know, putting him in front and stuff. And so that, that added to it. That was, that was the other side of it too. Uh, well, he told me that, I mean, I said, how do you promote your work? I mean, you spend a great deal of time, as everybody has pointed out, in his studio, late hours and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so he told me he hired an agent. Now, I have no idea who that person is, um, I know that there, no, I don't know. I have heard from him that a lot of um, well-known athletes purchased his paintings and somebody had to put them out there for him to know about it. Well, I'm so glad we had this opportunity to get together and uh, I've learned a lot about Mark that I didn't know, so. Well, I feel yeah. a lot honored that you asked me. Because well, I knew you told me you, you knew him and admired him and oh, he, like him. I say, he 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 just a super individual, yeah. super individual. And like I say, all you have to do is look at what you see around. The to me, the beauty is with Mark's work, you can look at it and you know what it is. Yeah. Somebody doesn't have yeah. to tell you this is what he did. <laughs> yeah.